I'd like to continue a theme that I began last week concerning the teachings of Christ during his final week as a mortal and also draw from particular events that transpired during that final week. Now, as you know, Jesus was cut off in the midst of the week, most likely a Wednesday, in order to fulfill three days and three nights in the lower parts of the earth. And I would favor that it was even maybe a little closer to three and a half days rather than shorter than those three. But um, he had to be cut off at least by Wednesday. So right in the middle of the week, he was cut off. And the point, of course, is that Jesus' main ministry during this final week of his life was during the first half of that final week. Now, Israel then rejects the greatest light and the greatest witness that the world has ever known, and at that point they're given over to to darkness. Now, what I've been gleaning from this little study is the similarity between the last week of Jesus' life as a mortal and the last week of the church age. Now, when I say the last week, as I mentioned last week, I'm using this word week quite a bit, but the last week of the church age, we're talking about the last seven years of the church age. So his betrayal and death in the midst of the week, followed by the trial leading up to the culmination of with a resurrection, it all fits into the last seven years, the last week of the church age. Now I'm going to try to explain this again from Daniel, because Daniel prophesied of 70 particular weeks that were, and when I say weeks, I'm talking about weeks of years. How long is 70 weeks of years? How many years would that be? 490. Interesting number because Jesus said forgive 490 times, didn't he? 70 times 7. But these particular years were to work Israel's ultimate redemption. So there are increments during this, this seven year, 70 year period of time. The first one mentioned is seven weeks of years, which is how many years? 49. The next increment was 62 weeks, which is how many years? 434 years, leaving one more seven-year period of time, one more week to, to, do, to work out the ultimate redemption of Israel. Now, Daniel is seeking the Lord in chapter 9 of his book, book of Daniel, and he's given the understanding of Israel's future. So we're looking at Daniel chapter 9, just so you understand the weeks that we're talking about. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Beginning at verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins and to make a reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Has this happened yet? Not at all. They're still in their sins. They haven't been purged completely yet, but there was these certain number of years determined upon them to bring in an end and bring a final purge because of their rejection. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. It could interpret holy place. Some think that it's talking about Christ himself. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. How many years? Forty-nine. Um, this is one increment of time. And it begins back in the Restoration era. And three score and two weeks, 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. 
And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now, here's 69 weeks that have been fulfilled. Seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69. And he prophesies that their Messiah would be cut off. I don't know what Israel does with these, with this word here. They're looking for the Messiah, but it says he's going to be cut off. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who did that? Titus in 70 AD destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And of course he was a prince because his father was the, the Caesar. He was the, the emperor, uh, Vespasian. His father was the emperor at the time. He was a prince. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So 69 of these weeks bring us to the ministry of Christ and his crucifixion. Now we jump all to the end of the church age for the final week of their purge. We're taking a jump. And this next week is going to jump over the whole church age, right to the very end of the church age. Picking up in verse 27, and he, this is the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. How long is that? Seven years. <clears throat> and he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the over, I'm sorry, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even to the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate or the desolator. Now this last seven week, this last, I'm sorry, the last week, seven year period, begins with a dealing in Israel and it includes the great tribulation. In the midst of the week, the Antichrist, son of perdition, is revealed. And that begins the great tribulation. I hope I'm making myself clear here. This also affects the church because the church is going to be on trial as well. And the tears are going to be cleansed from the church during this last three and a half years of the church age. Now I want to review again the similarities between the last week of Christ and the last week of the church age. So first of all, let's consider the last week of Christ. This is last week of Christ as a mortal. It begins with triumphal entry, cleansing of the temple. Um, Gives us a picture of revival. Then there's great teaching and miracles that take place in the temple. This is all still in the beginning of the last week. In the midst of the week, the son of perdition is revealed, lifts up his heel against the Most High, the Son of God. And then the greatest witness and light of all time is rejected and killed. And then comes a time of darkness and the saints are being tried. The following Sunday, of course, uh, breaks with the resurrection and the first fruits. There's a first fruits resurrection at that time. And then there's a new beginning. What's the new beginning? It's a church age. Amen? There's a new dispensation. Now, are you getting the similarities here, the parallel between the last week of Christ. Now let's consider the last seven year period of the church age, the last week. There's revival at the beginning. And uh, I have so many verses, I, I, I'm just summarizing things, but there's revival in the beginning of that last seven year period, represented by the two witnesses. And who are the two witnesses? Moses and Elijah, whom Israel is supposedly following, and they speak of companies that will be existing at the time. 
the teachers and prophets, beginning of the first three and a half years. And then in the midst of the week, seven years, the witnesses are rejected and killed. Same pattern, right in the midst of the week. The son of perdition is revealed, and he desecrates the temple. The powers of darkness are given a season to try the saints of the Most High. And at the conclusion of this week, there is also a resurrection um, that takes place, first resurrection. And you see this in Revelation 20. And of course, the new age begins. A new age begins, which is the millennium. There's a lot of other details that fit into here, but just trying to give you a little comparison between the last week of the life of Christ, the last week of the church age. So we're going to return to the teachings of Christ that he gave during the first half of this last week as a mortal. And remember that these teachings are especially relevant for our day. We're living in the closeout of an age where there's abounding iniquity with In the very end, the love of many wax cold, and there's a a departure in spite of revival. It's kind of, kind of a, I guess you'd call it an oxymoron, but there's revival, and at the same time, there's the Laodicean element where many are, are lukewarm because of pressure and so on. Many lose the fervor, lose the anointing, the lamp goes out, as we saw last week. Uh, many forfeit, many are separated. Um, we saw these parables last week, the ten virgins, uh, talents, and so on. But I want to return to Matthew 25 now. Finally get to our teaching here. Matthew 25, and we're looking at the remainder of this chapter. And this gives us a little picture of the second coming and the Lord's judgment of the nations. Now, this is not the great white throne judgment, but there is a judgment that takes place when the Lord returns. He's going to judge the nations and separate the sheep from the goats. All right, let's begin at verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Now, I think it's possible that um, this kind of... Uh, Preview is something else that will take place at the end of the millennium, but, I mean, it could have double application. But let's just consider this in the light of the second coming where he comes, there's going to be an initial judgment, and he's going to judge the nations, sheep nations, and the goat nations. And if you'd like a reference, this illusion that I'm talking about in millennium, or I'm sorry, in the at the end of the millennium, you can put down... Revelation 21, 24, because the nations are separated again, even on the new earth. Um, But we're looking at this at the onset of the millennium. Christ comes back, and there's going to be an initial judgment of the nations. Now, we're looking at sheep nations and goat nations. Sheep nations symbolize those that submit to God's will, goat nations symbolize those who rebel. The goat symbolizes rebellion, the sheep uh, submission. Now, these sheep nations are distinguished by two factors. If you take a look around the world, what distinguishes the sheep nations from other nations? Number one, they are pro-Israel. They bless Israel. As going right back to Abraham, Genesis 12, 3, 
those who bless Israel are the blessed nations. Those who curse Israel are the cursed nations. So you've got that factor. And then also how these nations minister to the poor and needy. As we shall see as we continue on here. So we're getting on to verse 34 through 40. And the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was and hungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee as a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto them. One of the least <coughs> of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Now, again, I want to emphasize the fact that Christ is in us as Christians. And when we minister to one another's needs, we're ministering to Christ. Is that right? It's not just people that we're ministering to, but Christ is in us. We're talking about the very least in the kingdom. As you've helped and ministered to those in need, the Lord said, you've, you've done it unto to me, because Christ is in you and in me. And even when we minister to the stranger, to the alien, those outside the kingdom, it is unto Christ. Do you believe that? Because Christ, that is the very nature of Christ. He is good to the just and unjust. Um, and those outside the kingdom, and we're to do it as unto the Lord. Whether they love him or not, the true Christian is going to minister to anybody in need that isn't truly in need. They're not going to walk by him on the road. Now, take good note of this. It's the sheep nations that minister to the needy. When there's a disaster, when there's a cataclysm of some kind, in the earth, there's an earthquake, there's a tsunami, uh, there's a mudslide. Uh, who are the first responders? It's the Christian nations. Who's there first? We are. It's the nations that are Christians that are the first to respond. And you know, the interesting thing is, some of these other nations are the last responders. In fact, even, even a Muslim nation, for example, that suffers some kind of a disaster, other Muslim nations are the last to respond. We're there before they are. They don't even love their own. So nations are evaluated on this topic as well as individuals. Now, one more point here we don't often consider. When the Lord returns, there's not only a judgment of the nations, but God is going to judge churches. And I mentioned this last Wednesday night. He's going to judge churches. Uh, I picked this up from something Pastor Bailey related one time. I never really considered it before, but, you know, it seems very clear at the moment. It's like the seven churches in Revelation. The Lord evaluated each one of those churches. When the Lord returns, the Lord is going to evaluate the congregations that are upon earth at the time. So the question is, did we as a church fulfill the commission that God assigned us to? We don't think of ourselves as being judged as a church, but God is going to evaluate every church group. 
every denomination, and including the pastor as well. So, did we preach and teach sound doctrine? Did we promote sound doctrine from the church? Did it align with the cornerstone? Did we uphold God's standard as a church? Did we use a lot, utilize our talents as a church? See, church groups are going to be evaluated as well. Have we increased ourselves? You, you can say to yourself, well, we haven't done too much. But in, in another sense, we have because we have increased ourselves much. It's maybe over there. Not too much here, but it's very close at the moment. Have we increased ourselves through lawful means? A lot of churches have increased themselves through all kinds of compromise. But I'm going to read a verse from Matthew 5, 19. And it says this, Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. How would you like to be a church that has compromised God's standards? Be called the least. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. Well, I want to have five stars over our church uh, in eternity that we've upheld God's standards, we haven't compromised, we've labored, um, we fulfilled the commission that God has given to us. And I feel, truthfully, that we've done up to this point what we were supposed to do, and we're doing what we're supposed to do at the moment. Although I think we could be a little bit more evangelical. But have we upheld God's standard on marriage, divorce, homosexuality, music, money? Many churches are about money. They use the pulpit as a ministry, as a cloak for covetousness. It's all about enriching themselves. Have we used the blessing of God to promote his kingdom? Why do we want the blessing anyway? To promote the kingdom of God. Lord, bless us that we might be a blessing, that we might take thy saving health to the nations. Someone was just telling me recently, they were describing a certain minister, and this is what they said about him. He's a taker. Now, that is not the ministry that Jesus represented. He was a giver. But they were talking about this man, not a big name person, but somebody that I know, and that's what they said about him. He's a taker. Have we fed the sheep? Have we nourished the sheep? Have we ministered the sheep? See, we're going to be evaluated as a congregation. I think it's good to have that in the back of your mind because as a group, we have got to evaluate it. So there's an initial judgment when the Lord sets up his millennial kingdom. And then it goes on and he's addressing those who have not uh, ministered to the needs of others. Verse 41 through 46, Then sh shall he say to those on the left, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil. And his angels, for I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. And he goes right down the list. I was sick in prison, you didn't come to me. And they answer him in verse 45, saying, Verily, or he says, uh, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it unto, not unto one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. So there is an initial judgment when the Lord comes, and this is not the white throne, but this is at the onset of the millennium. Okay, now let's back up and begin the Olivet Discourse, going backwards here. Go to Matthew 24, and obviously we're not going to finish Matthew 24 today, but I want to at least begin and perhaps 
get as far as the first question that the disciples are asking in Matthew 24. And what is Matthew 24? The Olivet Discourse. But what's it about? It's all about the last days. Of course, it does have a current application because they're saying, when shall these things be? That was the first question. And that's in relationship to the physical temple at the time. Now, Luke 21 and Mark 13 also align with Matthew 24, so you can get a different view. It's interesting because Matthew wasn't in on this discourse, or Luke, or Mark. None of them were in on this private discourse, this private interview on the Mount of Olives. So it had to be related to them because there were only four of the disciples that were in on this private interview about the end times. And of course, that was Peter, James, and John. And Andrew, you find that in Mark chapter 3. I'm sorry, 13, 3. Um, I think, too, that the fact that only one-third of the disciples were in on this private discourse concerning the last days tells us that there are many of God's people that are not really clear on what's going to take place in the last days, at least at this point. Only one-third of the disciples got in on this. Now, another interesting perspective concerns the similarity, again, between the first generation of the church and the last generation of the church. The first century, the last century of the church, because... When Jesus is describing what would precede the destruction of the temple, he's talking about natural calamities, catastrophes, many deceivers, wars, false Christs, persecution, martyrdom, and even the siege of Jerusalem gives us a kind of preview of the last day siege of Jerusalem. You know, the last day Jerusalem is going to experience a siege, right? In Zechariah 14, so there was a siege in the first century of Jerusalem. There shall be a siege at the very end of Jerusalem. I just want you to catch the similarities between the two. Now, this siege of Jerusalem in the first century began around 67. And it lasted about three and a half years. Is that kind of interesting, isn't it? Titus was having a hard time taking this city. In fact, he was kind of losing face because it was taking him so long to take Jerusalem. And there was all kinds of factions and divisions and fighting within Jerusalem between different sects. They were burning up their own supplies and things within the city, which seemed to be typical for them. And it lasted about three and a half years, which led many commentators to the preterous view. Now, do you know what the preterous view is? The preterous is, is looking backwards, and they're saying, these commentators are saying, that the Great Tribulation was fulfilled in 70 AD. Now, I'm amazed at how many of the commentators that we looked to were of the preterous view that the Great Tribulation is past. And they take it back to 70 AD because it was a three and a half year uh, siege of the city and the city was destroyed and there was great distress and then there was a dispersion and so on. Am I boring you this morning? Um, really, these are things that are I think we need to all be aware of as we're getting closer to the end. I mean, it certainly gives us a preview. The siege of Jerusalem, 67 through 70, uh, 
but too many other factors are missing. You know, so this has to take place again, and of course Zachariah says that. Okay, we're looking at Matthew 24, verse 1 through 3. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to shew him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one here, one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Now they moved to the Mount of Olives. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I think end of the age would be better translation here. I ask him three questions here. Well, you know, the disciples are ooing and aahing at the magnificent craftsmanship in Herod's temple. It was a it was a magnificent work. It was grandiose, far bigger than Solomon's temple. Herod um, kind of took on from the temple that was there and remodeled it and expanded and enlarged it. And, and uh, he was an architect. He was a renowned architect. So he really uh, made a grandiose work. He was trying to win the Jews. But Jesus said, this impressive work of man is going to be thrown down. There's not going to be one stone left upon another. It's all coming down. And I think I pointed out before that this temple was uh, not built according to divine specs. It was all human ingenuity. Now, three questions come up here. When is this going to be? When's this temple going to go down, this destruction? And what's going to be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age, I think, would better would be the better translation. Well, let's go on to verse 4 through 9. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear wars, rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, in divers places. All these are at the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. My name's sake. This is to the Christians. This is to the followers of Christ, for my name's sake. Important that you grab that little part of the sentence. So he says, deception's coming. There's going to be wars and skirmishes. Famines and pestilence. All of these things occurred in the first century. In fact, you see some of them in the Acts. See Agabus prophesying of a dearth that came to pass in the days of Claudius, uh, covered the whole earth. Talking about famine. Um, you see different cataclysms that take place, which I, I don't want to get into. Um, and deception. And I want us to be clear on this, that what happened here in the first century is going to repeat again in the last century. You look at that and you say, oh, that was past tense. No, no. It all repeats again. Deception, wars, pestilence, famines. Everything that happened in the first century is going to take place again. It leads us up to the very the grand final. So all of these signs to the first century church are for us as well. You shall be hated for my name's sake. So these are prophetic warnings to the followers of Christ. Now, John Gill, uh, any of you get into commentaries here? John Gill, if you have e-sword, John Gill, he was actually a theologian. I think he filled in for Spurgeon after Spurgeon left. He 
took over his work. Maybe it was before, before or after. One of the two. <laughs> anyway, but he lists some names of some of the first century deceivers, the false Christs that existed at the time. They're not all mentioned in the Bible, but this is just secular history. He mentions Thutis, time of Claudius Caesar, which was before the destruction, who persuaded a great number of people to follow him to the Jordan. He was going to open up the Jordan and cause God's people to pass through. Here's a historical character that claimed to be Christ. And then there's an Egyptian mentioned in Acts 21.38. He led a great company out into the wilderness, asserting himself to be the deliverer. You know, when Jesus said many, he meant many. Many shall be deceived. Then there was Simon Magus, and he claimed to be the word of God. He claimed to be the son of God. And Dositheus, Dositheus, he also asserted himself to be Christ. He was from Samaria. And Menander affirmed himself that no one could be saved unless they were baptized in his name. And there are a number of characters like this, unnamed, but they're historical, that claim to be Christ. There were all kinds of deceivers for a century. Many unnamed messiahs, false Christ. Before Jerusalem fell, and even at the end of the first century, John is saying there are many antichrists. He's the only one who uses that word, antichrist. Um, he was dealing with the Gnostics and the Cetus, um, and particular, uh, false prophets at the time. But he uses this word five times. He's the only one who uses the word antichrist. I just want to read you one verse. This isn't going to be long here. We'll try to climax this pretty quick. Um, but in 1 John 2.18, it says, uh, this is John, he says, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. The last time, which tells you the first century church is a preview of the last century church. Are you with me on this? So the first century of the church parallels the last century, many false prophets. And again, even the siege of Jerusalem parallels the siege that is kind of the last event before the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives. Only when he stands on the Mount of Olives, uh, at this time, Israel's delivered. They weren't delivered at 70 AD. So we see um, in the end, that, that there's going to be many false prophets, antichrists, represented by the antichrist and the false prophet that will represent many in the last day. And also, in this last week, there are two witnesses that represent many prophets and teachers in the last days, too. Now, Coming back to the thought of the false prophet and deception, we're running out of time here. However, I want to look at the first question that they asked Christ. When shall the temple be destroyed? Now, Luke's version gives a better description, a little bit better clarity on this, because um, he adds a few things that help us to bring closure on this. And so I want to divert over for a minute to Luke. In fact, we'll end here. Going back to Luke. I shouldn't say going back, but going to Luke 21. This is the Olivet Discourse from Luke. And the same signs are leading up to the destruction, deception, persecution, which took place in the Acts. Isn't that correct? There was a great persecution against the church. The church got scattered. There was martyrdom. In fact, Paul was one of the, the uh, persecutors 
in the first century. We're looking at Luke 21, 20. And here is the answer to the first question, when is this going to happen? And he preludes it by different things that will take place. And then he says in verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then shall ye know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now, this is first century. This is not the end. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Now, actually, if you go back to the history of the times, Josephus, many of the Christians in Jerusalem had heeded prophetic warnings, and they got out of that city and went into the hills of Pella. So they, a lot of the Christians were not in on the destruction here. Verse 22, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now look, this is not the end. This is not the siege in Zechariah. Because remember, after the fall of Jerusalem, there was an enslavement of the prisoners and they were scattered. There was a dispersion and they were carried off into the nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This is the answer to the first question. So all of these signs were leading up to the first destruction. And I'm just going to repeat again that all of these signs are going to be repeated leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem at the end. Half the city falls right at the very end. But in this case, they're not scattered to the nations because the Lord himself comes back, stands on Mount Olives, on the Mount of Olives, and their enemies are destroyed. Okay, so there's the first century destruction of Jerusalem and then the last century Great parallel between the two, the first century and the last century. And if you want, for your notes, you can put Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. Okay, time is up here, but um, we want to understand, have an understanding of our times, like, like the sons of Issachar children of Issachar, they understood the times and seasons. God wants us to be aware of our times, and I think we need to put a little bit more emphasis on this because we're we're into these days, we're in the beginning of these days right now, and we see deception on every hand, and we'll get more into this in our next session. But the wise shall understand. Amen? So this first question is answered. What's going to take place before the destruction? Much deception. There's going to be persecution, martyrdom, natural calamities and wars. And all of this was something that also took place first century. All to be repeated again. Let it be said. Till the likeness of Jesus
be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. Let it be said of us, we were marked by forgiveness, we were known by our love, and delighted in meekness, we were ruled by his peace, eating unity's call, join as one body that Christ would be seen by all. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. By mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong, let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. Till the likeness of Jesus be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. By mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. Till the likeness of Jesus be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song.